From October the 15th to December the 15th, 1955, the US Army ran a massive exercise called Sagebrush. It was the largest such manoeuvre conducted thus far in the Cold War and involved between 85,000 and 140,000 troops. Sagebrush is best known for the extensive employment of simulated nuclear artillery shells fired by big 8-inch artillery pieces. While that's definitely both cool and profoundly terrifying, for me the most interesting and least covered aspect of Sagebrush relates to air superiority. The Air Force contributed numerous squadrons to the operation, simulating the aggressor as well as the US forces. Their tactics and conclusions show how the Tactical Air Force was thinking about fighting the next war. It offers an insight into the thinking that informed the procurement choices they made and the way in which they directed force design and training. That force was intended to fight the Soviets in Europe, but ended up in a conventional battle for air superiority in Southeast Asia. The scenario in Sagebrush was that an aggressor state had secured a foothold on the US Gulf Coast. And why not? It's lovely. This was a theatre-scale setting in which simulated atomic, chemical and biological weapons would be used. For the first time in a large exercise, electronic warfare systems would be deployed at significant scale. This was the environment in which the Eisenhower-era military expected to fight. Sagebrush was initially designed to be a free-play scenario. Nuclear weapons, or atomics as they were generally referred to in the period, would be plentifully used. That's their description, by the way. The US would have a slight advantage in the volume of available nuclear weapons, reflecting the strategic and tactical situation of the time. The 100,000 or so real troops were there for realism and practice. The paper war game that accompanied the exercise represented well over a million combatants. Between 700 and 800 aircraft participated. Six squadrons of F-86F Sabres formed the backbone of the US force. They were supported by two squadrons of F-86D Sabre Dogs as all-weather and night fighters. The bomber force consisted of two squadrons of antique B-26 Marauders two squadrons of RF-84F Thunderjets and two RB-66 Invader squadrons were on reconnaissance duty, and four squadrons of KB-29 tankers provided aerial refuelling support. This force looked rather old-fashioned. The F-86F was being phased out of the frontline force at this time, with some of the later fighter-bomber squadrons being refocused on nuclear delivery and the rest either transferred to Allies or the Guard. The Sabre Dogs were in plentiful supply, but had been somewhat superseded by the Scorpion as a night fighter in the US. Neither type was desperately useful in any case, but it's always nice to be up to date. The B-26 Marauder, however, was truly obsolete and in fact lacked nuclear weapons delivery capability. As part of the rules of the game, it was assumed that all platforms except those tasked only with air defence had a nuclear weapons delivery capability. The US force did, however, enjoy the advantage of aerial refuelling. The aggressor role was played by a collection of the latest aircraft in the US inventory. Six squadrons of F-86H Sabre Hog fighter bombers formed the core of the enemy force. The Hog was significantly more powerful than the F, although its increased weight and increased wing loading made it less manoeuvrable and reduced its effectiveness at higher altitudes. The Hog counters with greater acceleration, better sustained turning performance and greater range. Some of the hogs deployed also had cannons rather than the F model's machine gun armament. Although the purists may prefer the F sabre, particularly those with the 6-3 wing and extended tips, in a tactical sense the hog was the superior aircraft. That is especially true of its capabilities as a fighter bomber. Two squadrons of the brand new F-100A super sabre were the aggressor's frontline day fighters, these had only entered service a year before and were the only truly supersonic fighters available to either side. The defending forces had no reasonable counter to the Super Sabre, although its high attrition, low availability rate and short range would have impeded its effectiveness in a real conflict. The obligatory Sabre Dog Squadron provided night fighter cover. Martin B-57 Canberras were the main bomber force, far superior to the Marauders, 
and it was these aircraft that were the first to strike when the exercise kicked off. The scenario called for a friendly reconnaissance aircraft escorted by eight fighters to be attacked by the aggressor, leading to the latter launching a surprise attack on the US air bases. How much of a surprise this would really be in reality is questionable. General Wayland was the supreme commander of both sides, and he was the umpire. He couldn't lose, which is appropriate. As we all know, senior generals never make mistakes, and they are always winners. The other thing that grates slightly in the scenario is that the enemy have somehow invaded the Gulf Coast and then achieved a truce with a demilitarised zone, so it must be a massive surprise that they then launch another attack. Anyhow, the US forces were well dispersed. One squadron was on each airbase. Each of the 49 bases in the exercise had been equipped with a nuclear simulator. These consisted of two bombs. The first was a smoke-generating liquid chemical agent that created a white mushroom cloud. The other part was a ball of C4 to make the blast sound effect. When a base was adjudged to have been nuked, the umpire detonated the device and made an assessment of damage. In the history books, the Air Force seems very proud of these as they generated a very impressive effect and cost only $40. Anyhow, At 1926, on the 15th of November, US radar detected nine aircraft coming over the demilitarized zone. General Waygood gave the defenders the go-ahead to engage with the exceptionally jockish instruction, batter up. Incidentally, in Britain that instruction refers to the preparation of fish and chips. I understand that it has a different connotation in the US. The B-57s tore into the US forces. Attacking at night, they easily evaded the defending sabre dogs. Within the first two hours, they had knocked out 18 airbases with nuclear weapons. Two attacks against Langley and Shaw bases were one way, which seems to have surprised the defending forces. The US defenders' sole successes in this phase of the battle were knocking out one base and one radar using nuclear tip tactical missiles. And as a result, by the morning of the 16th, the aggressive forces had air superiority over the forward edge of the battle area. At daybreak, both sides launched more strikes, which took out all but five of the remaining US bases and 11 of the aggressor bases. The US ones didn't last the night as the Canberras returned and knocked them all out. Aggressor force air dominance was now complete. To keep play going, the umpires allowed bases that had been obliterated to be magically returned to use within one and three days. Even so, over the next four days, the aggressor forces maintained enough pressure on the US bases to suppress all repair activities. Otherwise, they focused their efforts on reconnaissance and battlefield interdiction. Their close air support efforts enabled ground forces to establish a bridgehead over the Red River and push back the US defenders. This phase of the exercise ended at 0600 on the 22nd. The immediate conclusion was that nuclear war happened at a far faster pace and with much more decisive results than conventional war when it came to the air forces. Both sides reset so that a new scenario could then be tried. In this one, the US side was able to launch a preemptive strike whenever they chose. So at 0800 on the 29th of November, the US launched a massive nuclear strike on aggressor air bases and fixed installations. Waves of F-86Fs armed with nuclear weapons and B-26s with conventional bombs hammered the aggressors. In total, 51 nuclear bomb attacks and two tactical missile strikes hit aggressor bases, knocking out 18 of 19 of them in the first four hours. The aggressors had detected the strikes and their counterattack destroyed 15 of 25 US bases in return, but even so the air war was over within that first four hour period. The air force and higher ups were very happy with this. Employment of the learnings from the previous tactical phase had led to total victory. The most telling conclusion that the air force appeared to take away from Sagebrush was that fighters were significantly less useful in a modern conflict. In previous wars, the side with the combination of the most fighters, the best fighters and the best pilots held air superiority. When the bombers were armed with nuclear weapons, however, it only took one to destroy an entire base. Even if the fighters were not there when the bombs hit, their supplies, support staff and of course the runway would be severely damaged. 
In both playthroughs of the scenario, whoever struck first eliminated all of the airfields closest to the line of contact within a matter of hours. Although the exact level of attrition suffered by the attacker in accomplishing this is unclear, it was obviously not enough to prevent subsequent waves finishing the job. The defending force was therefore forced to conduct operations from much further away. That both made life difficult by reducing loiter time and in terms of sortie production. In those circumstances, the attacker would have a big advantage in close air support sorties. The main conclusion from this was that air forces needed to be pushed further back and be more dispersed. This in turn created a conflict with the army. Because of the need to hold a front line, the army could only disperse linearly. They could dig in to protect themselves, but they had to be physically in a line of some sort. The air force had typically deployed on fields that ran parallel to that line. Proximity to the front meant that they could produce a lot of sorties and rapidly respond to the changing situation on the ground. But in a nuclear war like that envisaged in Sagebrush, those airfields would only last a matter of minutes or a few hours. The air force needed to disperse in depth as well as linearly. That, in turn, meant that they would need to separate their objectives and command and control from the field army that they were there to support, at least in the initial days of the conflict. The sagebrush conclusion therefore reduced the importance of close air support and increased the importance of nuclear weapons delivery for fighter bombers. As it happens, this had already been the Air Force's view since the early 1950s. They had insisted on the last versions of the F-86 being able to carry special stores. The Sabre Hog was designed around that requirement, although issues with the Super Sabre led to it being seen as much as a fighter as a bomber for much of its short career. Attack aircraft needed to be very fast. Their ability to loiter or to spot and attack targets of opportunity was of secondary importance. Conveniently, this was the exact balance of capabilities found in the forthcoming F-105 Thunder Chief. A further implication of Sagebrush was that air superiority, which had hitherto been a battle between opposing fighters in the air, was now a battle between nuclear-armed bombers and air bases. The B-57 made a particular impression. It was fast, operated at very high altitudes for the time, in the dark and in all weathers. An intercepting fighter had at most one chance to make a firing pass. If it failed, there was no way it could make a second one because by that point the bomber would be over the target. Such was the danger that the B-57s posed that even if one aggressor based equipped with it had been operational at nightfall, it would have knocked out almost all of the US bases by the following morning. The umpires scored the probability of kill on an airbase attacked by two nuclear-armed B-57s as 98.6%. Longer range to operate from deep and all-weather nuclear delivery capabilities to allow for night attacks were therefore the order of the day. The fast, rangy B-66 destroyer started to enter service in 1956, providing these capabilities, but it was, however, still tied to long runways. On the defensive side of the equation, up to this point the Air Force had retained a certain separation between fighters designed to attack other fighters and those intended to attack bombers. Sagebrush worked in favour of those in the Air Force who believed that there was no point in designing fighters optimised to kill other fighters. All fighters needed to have a primary interception role. If they were more successful in that mission than the enemy's interceptors, then they would have won air superiority by virtue of the fact that all of the enemy's bases were smoking radioactive holes in the ground. Those fighters needed to be fast in a straight line and have long-ranged missiles capable of front-quarter engagement. That pursuit curve was essential to push the bombers back further away from the vulnerable air bases. Surface-to-air missiles would back up the fighters. These were not new ideas in the Air Force either. They had been the reality in the Air Defence Command since the late 1940s. But the history of Sagebrush is a tantalising insight into why tactical warfighters embraced the same theory of victory in the second half of the 1950s and into the 60s. They made an assumption that tactical conflicts would be fought with nuclear weapons. They ran a massive war game to simulate that scenario and then based their strategy on it. Perhaps if one of the scenarios had involved only conventional weapons, then the conclusions would have been different, or at least more nuanced. 
and all of the conclusions about air superiority and the value of interceptors were skewed in the wrong direction by one rule of the game. In it, the defending forces were only able to launch their fighters when the umpires ruled that they had an actual radar trap on an enemy formation. This meant that the defenders had a matter of minutes to get their interceptors and bombers airborne. And of course this is totally unrealistic. Even minimal combat air patrols would detect the enemy earlier from their high vantage point and be able to disrupt the attack to a certain degree. MiG-15s wreaked havoc on US bomber formations in Korea in exactly this scenario. The rule seems to have been specifically invented to give the advantage to the attacker and it essentially negated the usefulness of the scenario to the Air Force, which was, of course, what the planners wanted. This was a nuclear exercise after all. Although more of a confirmation of existing doctrine than a conclusion, it's worth quickly talking about nuclear weapon control in the scenario. You might expect that this would be a point about not shooting off too many warheads, but you'll be mostly wrong in that. The official historians writing about Sagebrush seem completely happy with the local Air Force commanders shooting off nuclear bombs like their 50 cal. What they're worried about is whether those same commanders would leave any warheads left in the stockpile for theatre commanders to use for strategic purposes. What exactly they're expecting to be left to nuke at this stage is not documented. The US was allocated 275 warheads, the aggressor had 230, yields ranged from 20 to 200 kilotons, and over the course of the exercise around 19 megatons worth of simulated bombs were dropped. Fortunately for the theatre commanders though, they still had 15% of the total left over to drop on whatever else they fancied. Incidentally, the army was also using hundreds of nukes to carve its way through the aggressor's land army. By the end of the exercise, Louisiana would have been glowing in the dark. The reporting at the time was horrifyingly casual. To give you an idea of relative size, Louisiana is about a third as big as Germany and thus represents the centre of the country which have been in the line of contact between the Soviet Union and NATO. The total exercise area is roughly the size of Northern Europe, and this was the way the US Air Force intended to defend the free world. Damage assessment at the time was that this explosive power would have killed 20,000 troops and destroyed 2,700 vehicles. The effects of fallout were not calculated, nor was there any attempt to calculate civilian casualties. The only comment on civilians is that some towns might have been left like ghost towns. Because of the tremendous destructive power and seeming impossibility of retaining any air war fighting ability after the first strike, Air Force doctrine swung to the terrifying. In the event of a conflict with a nuclear-armed Air Force, the only way to win was a massive nuclear first strike with no warning or gradual escalation. One moment you should be looking at each other, the next they should be radioactive debris. Major General Timberlake, one of the commanders, held the view that the great danger in an enemy Air Force managing to reconstitute some fighting power and attack with its own nuclear weapons meant that overkilling was much preferable to underkilling. And this of course led to the development of ever larger bombs, faster missiles and larger aircraft. These were, by consequence, less and less useful for establishing air superiority in a conventional sense, or for close support of ground troops with conventional weapons. And this inevitably led to heavier aircraft that needed longer runways, that were more vulnerable and so on and so forth. It's a downward spiral of tactical capability that was only broken long after Eisenhower and LeMay had left the scene and Rolling Thunder's lessons were burned into the institutional psyche. It would be nearly 20 years until a more traditional version of air superiority reasserted itself.